So just in this little four-week sermon series on building blocks of faith, we talked about the first part is how to learn to walk like a follower of Jesus Christ. Next, last, last week, excuse me, we talked about how to talk like one, which means how to pray. Jesus was very specific when he talked about prayer and the things that you're supposed to pray about. And so we couldn't cram it all into one week, so this is going to be a continuation of last week. And we asked the question, if, if we're really honest, how many of your prayers are really answered? I mean, like big prayers, like those type of prayers that probably weren't going to come true anyway. Um, I mean, we said last week, yes, you found your car keys, but they were right where you left them. Um, yeah, you found a close parking space, but so did 50 other people. So, so are our prayers just shaking the foundation of the earth or sometimes do you feel like your prayers just aren't being answered and so you don't even pray big things because you haven't seen that powerful movement of God in your life. And so some just stop praying altogether. I mean, you pray for meals because you feel like you have to. Um, probably wouldn't pray for meals if your kids weren't there because you're trying to raise them right. And the prayer life just kind of fizzled out. There are some that even left the faith because of it, because they just didn't see any movement in their, their life of prayer. And so last week we said, could it be that we've been praying wrong when we're praying? Not, not that any conversation with God is bad. So there's two things I think when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to pray and read the Word of God. And I don't really care how you do that. Um, I, you just talk to God. If you've never prayed before, talk. That's a start. Um, and the second thing is read the Bible. I mean, I, I'd like for you to start in John or Matthew, or there's some places where it'd be great to start in, but if you don't want to start there for whatever reason, start somewhere. Just get into God's Word. Prayer is one of those things that it's hard to do wrong because that fellowship with God is always good, but is there something we could do better? And the disciples, I think, ran into this. Their prayers weren't being answered, and there's a great example of I just... Part of my new Bible reading plan, so several, uh, golly, probably years ago now, have you ever noticed the older you get, the more your stories, you don't have any timetable? Because I was going to say, hey, just like last year, no, it's been like 10 years ago. I kind of changed my Bible reading plan, not just to run through the Bible in a year, but to do some different things. And one of the things I'm doing this year is reading the Gospels, um, like kind of one story or one episode at a time, and then looking for some history and looking for some truth that happened during that story and try to see what that would have really been like. Because, because we, we kind of get some of that out of whack, especially people, if you're like me, who were raised in a church, your vacation Bible school understanding of some of these Bible stories was good, and you understand the story of Jesus and you know Zacchaeus, Jesus walked by, and Zacchaeus climbed a tree and all that, but to see how that would have fleshed out in the flesh, literally in the streets of Jerusalem, kind of changes the story a little bit and gives you a greater understanding. This is one of those times where I read and I thought, the disciples finally said, Jesus, tell us how to pray. Because we see you doing this. We see you praying all the time. And I think in the back of their minds, although they never said it, I'm pretty sure they would have said, you pray at some really inopportune times. Like we have finally gathered a following of thousands of people, enough movement to give Rome a run for their money. You send us across the lake and you run off in the wilderness to pray. And so, obviously, we're doing something wrong. Show us how to pray. And so then Jesus takes that opportunity and teaches them. I think one of the things that's neat is Jesus never tells them how to pray before they asked. Because I think that would be, like, horribly offensive and, and borderline rude. If, so you come over to my house and we're eating. And I'm like, hey, you want to open up in prayer? Um, and you're like, yeah, sure. So you, you pray. And when you're done praying, I'm like, you know what? Let me teach you how to pray because that was awful. I mean, that was just the worst display of prayer I've ever seen. You'd kind of be offended, right? Well, the disciples ask, and then Jesus answered. He's like, yeah, when you pray, pray like this. And so um, last week, and I think I'm going to pull this out here because I think some of these are in the bottom parts of your notes. Um, yes, at the very bottom, we talked about what we looked at last week. Here are the four things 
that we said are extremely important in starting prayer. I don't have time to unpack all of them because I'd love for you to go watch part one. You can look online, um, go to our Facebook page, or you can even go to uh, um, the website, Vimeo, YouTube, wherever you watch videos, and you can download these things and watch them. Um, But we said, number one, we pray to God, our Father. That's how Jesus started. Um, You don't pray to the saints. You don't pray to me. You don't pray to Mary. Jesus said you pray to God, your Father. Remember last week we said that that there are some times where some of you have had bad relationships with your dad, but you know what a good relationship with a father would be like. And so pray as though God is your Father because he truly is. And then the second thing we said is pray in secret. Find a spot where you can get alone with God and just you and God, and you can have that conversation even daily with your Heavenly Father. Then we said, um, don't babble, which kind of looks silly up there on the screen without some context, but it's not about fancy words and saying the right things. It's about a conversation with God. Um, I had the opportunity uh, when I first, I've I've said this a hundred times, but when I first kind of went into the ministry to be around a group, there's about eight or nine, ten of us um, preacher boys in this big church. The pastor kind of took us under his wing, and we had to do assignments. We had to preach in nursing homes, and we had to do all of these things. We had to write sermons. We had to argue points. We had to debate things that we didn't agree with. Um, That was the hard part of this, and it was really a great time uh, together. But there were always people that would stand up and pray And the way they would preach and the way they would pray looked and sounded totally different than what they were in real life. I think, and I would love to say I'm not good at this, but I think that's a good thing. If you and I were having a conversation, I would sound just like I'm sounding now. Those of you that know me know that when you talk, this is not really different. I don't have a preacher voice. But when I first started, I wanted one. I wanted to develop my preacher voice, and you can scroll through social media and things, and you can hear these guys, and um, they, when they start talking, it's just a totally different voice, totally different inflection, totally different things that they say, um, and there was one guy specifically that when he would preach, not necessarily pray, I got to stand up and show you how to do it, um, he, they had these big pulpits, and I told you last week, a guy would come up and pray, and he would say these magnificent prayers, and they were amazing, and he'd go sit down. And then the next guy would come up that would would preach, and he was amazing at preaching. The guy knew the Word of God. I mean, he was, I think he was like 700 years old, so he walked through most of that with Jesus back in the day. Um, And we, um, I was a children's pastor at the time, and so once a month I had to sit up on stage. Um, Some of you remember this. It may be good memories or bad memories, but you remember some of the old school things where there would be like four chairs back there, and then the important people would sit up on those chairs. And um, I actually had to do like a one-hour meeting with the pastor and the executive team on how to sit while you're up there, how to cross your legs. Um, We had certain colors that we could wear on those Sundays we were on stage and socks um, you know, all had to match, and you had to cross your legs a certain way. And then I remember as a children's pastor, one Sunday I decided I'm just going to wear Mickey Mouse socks and see if anyone notices, because this was a big church, about 5,000 people, and you couldn't see, I'm sure you couldn't see the socks. And then, you know, no one really said anything about my socks. I get an email Monday morning about 7.45 from the senior pastor who's like, hey, Greg, if you got a minute, can you come down to my office? And I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble for my socks. Um, And I did get in a little bit of trouble, but he said, I'm not going to tell you not to wear those socks. Just don't let me know you're wearing those socks. And I thought that meant, okay, he may like it. So then I got all these crazy funky socks. And once a month, it became kind of this thing to see what kind of socks I was wearing. Um, And that, for me, kind of shaped church life. But this one guy would stand, and every time he, he preached, he would like, he'd pull his pants up. And so um, we used to call it like he was hitching his britches. He'd like pull them up, and, and so he'd preach, preach. And then every time he got to a real, like a PowerPoint thing, he'd always walk over to the side, and he'd, he'd, he'd hitch his pants up, and he'd like let the people have it. And it was so cool um, watching him do that, because we're like young guys watching this all unfold. 
And I remember my friend Sean, he gets a turn to preach one Sunday, and sure enough, Sean comes on this big point he's about to make, and he like he does the same thing. And I'm like, he didn't just do that. Tell me. And the problem was this was this was like forever ago. So we didn't have videos back then, um, or that would have been the best thing in the world. Because you think, well, that's the way they did it. So if they did it that way, that must be the holy way to do it. So that's the way I'm going to do it. Well, Jesus, and we learned last week, said, don't, don't babble. Don't just say things because other people say things. Um, these recited canned prayers, uh, some of them, they don't change who we are. Jesus said, don't, don't do that. And you start off your prayer by declaring how great God is. And if you do that, then you realize why you're praying to begin with. If you've ever been in the vicinity of someone who is so much greater than you are or has so much um, upstanding, is upstanding citizen or someone who has all this fame and fortune, you just feel different in their presence. In such a much greater way, declaring how great God is makes you realize, okay, that's why I'm here, because I'm not as great as God is. Therefore, I need to be in his presence. Then we finished with this one. And I couldn't leave you there last week, so we're going to pick up a little bit more on that this week as Jesus talks about the prayer. Let me kind of read you the whole thing. I don't have all of these verses on the screen, but I'll read kind of what we picked up last week. Um, Jesus said, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. And then he says, therefore, pray like this. Um, Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you declare God's greatness. And then here's where we started. Um, And now if you're taking notes, this may be a little confusing because you're like, wait, didn't we write that down last week? Yep. We're going to pick up there because we're going to talk about not just learning how to talk or learning how to walk, but learning how to surrender in our prayers. What does it mean to surrender some things in our prayer life, which is what Jesus is talking about? So first we surrender our will. Here's how Jesus says it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if you've been to church longer than a few months, you've heard this whole prayer. And what Jesus is saying is, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life just like it is in heaven. And sometimes we skim past that. Last week, we started by saying, that's a real surrender of what we want. It's a real surrender of... God, I want your needs before my own. And so here's what prayer does from the very beginning. It brings us into alignment with God. Doesn't just help us get things. Because to be honest, when we pray, it's kind of what we do. God, bless me, feed me, clothe me, do all these things, heal me. Um, But Jesus says, you start your prayer differently. You realize that you want your life to be a reflection of, of God's will in heaven. And then we said, if you're not at that place, don't go on with your prayer because then it's probably just babble. If you're not at a place where you can surrender your will to say, God, whatever you want in, in my life, I'm willing to surrender it. So before I go on and ask for other things, before we even talk about some of this other stuff, I want you to know that I want my life to be in alignment with yours. So until you literally surrender your will, until we bring ourselves into that place where we say, God, we want whatever you would want for our life, we can't really go on with our prayers. If you remember last week, we said that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and his prayer took about 30 seconds, as far as we know. But then before the cross, he spent all night agonizing in prayer in the garden. 
praying a prayer that stressed him out so much, literal stress, that the blood capillaries in his sweat glands begin to burst, and he was sweating drops of blood in this prayer. Why? We're not exactly sure, but we can get a hint from some of the things that he says. And he says, God, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way to do this, let's do that. But then at some point in that night, he surrendered his will and he brought himself in alignment with the Father, obviously, and said, but not my will, but thine. The same type of prayer he told his disciples to pray, Jesus used. So, major point, I know we're not spending a ton of time on this one because we spent some time on it last week. Until you can surrender what you want, you can't really go on with your prayer because it's going to be out of line. Because the things that you might be asking for might not be what the will of God is. Okay, so the first part of surrender is surrender your will. Now, here's the second one. This one might sting a bit, but give me just a second. The second one is this. Surrender my independence. Surrender my independence. What I mean by sting a little bit is we've never been taught to do that. Not especially as red-blooded Americans. We are independent, and we don't need them. We don't need the government. We can do it ourselves. We, we, were, we were created, um, well, maybe not created. We were raised in a culture that taught us to be independent from the very first, being a child. I, one of the greatest things as a dad is um, when your kid can hold the bottle for himself for the first time. That's really where, and that's like kind of happening with Tanner, who, uh, my son, my oldest son, who's the drummer. It's kind of happened with his son, Toby. Um, when mom's home, everything's great, and you know she feeds the baby, and everything's perfect, but mom goes to work, dad gets these bottles and feeds Toby. And up until about now, Toby hasn't really been able to hold the bottle himself. Once, once the baby can hold the bottle, it's like, I'm out, you know, hands up. You got this, kid. Here's your bottle. And then you know what's coming. What's coming is just go to the fridge and get yourself something to eat, right? I mean, it's, it's a glorious thing. We're taught from the very beginning independence is important. But Jesus, in a weird way, says, no, I want you to surrender that independence from me. Here's how I think that he does that. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, this is taken out of context quite a bit, um, not really in a bad way, just one of those areas in the New Testament where we miss the huge picture of what he's saying. In a correct um, translation of the Greek, what Jesus would have been saying is, give us this day our daily manna. Same, same word from the Hebrew that meant manna. And so to the, to the people that are there, um, the Jews, even the Gentiles that were there, they would have remembered this. You know what they would have done? They would have went, oh, man, uh, I remember that. Now, most of us have never gone hungry to the point of worrying about if you don't get some nutrients, you may not survive. Most of us have not been, some of us maybe when you were raised or maybe earlier in life, um, let me just say, whether you're watching here or watching online, if you're in that spot right now, you have to let us know. Let us help. We can, we can help with those things. But most of us have never been to that degree of need. And Jesus says, in your prayer, you say, give us this day our daily manna. And their minds immediately went back about 1,800 years to when they were wandering around the wilderness didn't have time to set up farms, didn't have time to grow things because they were constantly on the move. God provided meals, literally, to-go boxes full of bread every single morning except for the Sabbath. And then he would give them twice the, as much the day before and it would last through the Sabbath. And you couldn't keep it overnight except on the Sabbath. You couldn't store it. Um, you, just, you just woke up every morning and there it is. They would wake up their tent, open or wake up, look out their tent, and go, there's manna. It's there. What's interesting is in the Hebrew, the word manna literally is translated, what is it? It's really nothing fancy. It's like, you know, the wife opened up her tent. She's like, honey, look. And then the wife, or the husband was like, huh, manna. 
The wife was like, I don't know. What do you think it is? I mean, that's literally what this was. They didn't have a name for it. They just called it manna. And every morning for 40 years in the wilderness, this is what they ate. God provided every single day. And they would eat this manna bread. And that would be their nutrients. I kind of wonder if they had like banana pudding, you know, and banana shortcake. And they just manna all the time. So much so that if they did not have this, they would die. So all these people have been taught this throughout the years, and they remember this story well. And Jesus says, when you pray, here's how I want you to pray. Give us this day our daily manna, because if I don't get it, I'm not going to survive. Okay, let's be honest. Most of us, not only have we never been there, we haven't really thought like that. Why? Because we have a job, and we have a savings account. And we can just go to Costco or we can go to some of these stores and we can buy our stuff. And and some of you crazy people, you conspiracy preppers and things, you have enough food in your house to last you for 13 years. And so you're good even if no more food is available. Do you remember when the toilet paper um, thing kind of crashed and we couldn't buy toilet paper and people like selling it on the streets? Um, I was part of that problem. I just happened to be at the store. My wife called, and she's like, man, things are just crazy. You should see the news. There's, like, going to be a run on everything. And so I was one of the ones that bought, like, 10 cases. I'm, like, shelling it out to my friends. I was like a a drug dealer with toilet paper. Um, It was kind of a great thing. We lost our minds when when you almost can't get something. You may not know this, but there's one particular big box store around that, um, they haven't had their, their own brand of water bottle in about a week, and so they use this other that I don't like. And so we haven't been able to buy water bottles in our house. And then my kids were like, hey, we're almost out of water. And I'm like, move out. I mean, I didn't say that. But that's what I thought. Um, they're like, we don't have any water bottles. And now we're like down to like half of a case in one of them, and I don't want to tell you which one. But one of them's like, what are we going to do? I'm like, I don't know. We're just going to never hydrate again or drink out of the tap, you crazy kid. Um, I'm going to teach you how to parent these kids in a way where you can keep your sanity and not kill them. Um, We're losing our minds. We don't have water bottles. So we have no concept of this. But when Jesus was telling him how to pray, he said, look, pray to God as though he's giving you that meal and you can't survive without it. That he is your only thing to be dependent on. So you surrender your independence. Literally, that was, that's number, I messed up the numbers because we're going from last week too. That's kind of number six. Surrender your, your independence. Give us this day our daily bread. <clears throat> Used to teach uh, swimming lessons. And there's imagery here that I think Jesus is trying to say to us, which is cool. But um, when I would teach kids swimming lessons in Florida when I was a kid, they, uh, they would like cling to my neck and like dig their nails into me, and I was their lifeline, and if I let them go, they would die, and they knew this in their brain, and I was very patient with them at work, but then I had to teach my own kids how to swim. By this time, I'm older, I'm much less patient, and I'm not getting paid for it, right? So I did a little bit different, but all all of my kids' personalities are so, so different, but my middle child... Um, Nathan, who plays the, the keyboard right now, he's on the live stream, so he has to listen to every single word I'm saying. So, hi, Nathan. Thanks for doing the live stream. But um, I was teaching him how to swim, and he, like, had a death grip around my neck. And I'm like, all right, ready? I'm going gonna, gonna to kind of push you, push you out and kind of let you float and let you do your own thing. He's like, no, I don't want to die. And my wife was there, and I'm getting impatient, and she's trying to give me patience, which, you know, that never really works. And finally, I'm like, all right, here we go. And he's like, no, I want the future. And I looked at my wife, and I'm like, what is up with this kid? And it was so funny. I was laughing so hard that I just didn't realize that I was still holding him. And he's like now like drowning because I'm laughing so hard trying to hold this kid. He's like, I want a future. We still joke to him about this day. He's like, you're not going to have a future. But, but he had a death grip on me because I was, he was so dependent on me. Here's Jesus' way of saying, I want you to be like that with me. I want you to have such a tight grip on Jesus Christ 
that if he doesn't provide for you every single day, you are not going to survive. There could be very few things in our life as un-American and almost slothful in its appearance than surrendering your independence. Because not a one of us has been raised that way. We've been raised just the opposite. You be independent. And Jesus said, not when you're praying with me. You realize that you have nothing on your own, that you cling to me in the same way a child clings to someone where they're learning how to swim because he provides your every breath that you take. Give us this day our daily bread is the way he says it. It's okay to ask, but remember that when you ask, you're dependent on God for it. Now, here's the second thing. We said the first thing, you can't go on if you can't surrender your will, right? Right? The next part is you can't go on unless you can surrender your independence, right? Because think about it. If if I'm praying and I want God to do all of these things for me, but I know in the back of my mind that if it doesn't work out, I have a backup plan. If If you are your heavenly father, how moved are you by someone who has a backup plan? don't really need them. Imagine in your relationship with your spouse, if you're like, honey, um, I know that we said I do, but there's about three girls that I dated in high school. I'm going to continue talking to them just in case this doesn't work out, right? I mean, how well would that go over like a ton of bricks upside your face, right? That's, That's just silly, that's just silly. Imagine with your kids. You have kids and, and you say, hey, um, we're going to keep some adoption papers and some brochures around here just in case we don't like you. I'm going to ship you off. We're going to get some. No. That sounds so incredibly ridiculous. But we do it all the time when we pray. We say, God, I, I want you to do this, but if not, I'm already formulating in my mind a backup plan. I'm so I'm so good at this. The way I do it is I... I say, God, if if you choose, I've even prayed this. I may have even prayed this in front of you. I hope not, but I may have even prayed this in front of you. God, if you you don't don't show me which way to go, this is the way that I'm going to proceed until you tell me differently. And I even think that attitude is wrong. Being willing to surrender your independence and say, I'm not going to move until you show me where to go. Most of us don't have a prayer life like that. We really haven't even kind of into the meat of the prayer. We haven't even finished this yet. And there's already two areas where when most of us pray, this is not how we do it. We might get alone. We might not babble. We might pray to God. We may do all those things last week. We definitely don't surrender our will. We've never been taught to surrender our independence. So this is brand new stuff. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. And if you don't get it, you're not going to survive. Okay, it gets worse. Ready? Here's number three. Surrender my hurt. If you're a theologian, you're probably like, what in the world? Where is he going with this? Okay, let me show you. This is, this is what I think he means. If, if surrender my independence stung a little bit, this is going to be downright painful. Here's the way he says it in his prayer. Verse 12 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, and forgive us our debts. And I wish he would have stopped right there. But then he doesn't. He says, as we also have forgiven our debtors. You don't know what makes me so mad sometimes in church life? <laughs> I don't even know if I should say that. Yeah, sure, I can say it. Because remember, my job is to say things you've thought but won't say out loud. Most of you, when I read that, your immediate thought For maybe half of you went through, well, I've always learned it, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. That was was kind of your first thought, like most of us. And we totally miss the point of what he's saying. Let me reword it for you. God, I want you to forgive me to the same degree that I am willing to forgive my coworker. I want you to forgive me to the same degree that I am willing to forgive my ex. I want you to use the same scale that I forgive other people 
to forgive me. And God, if I'm not willing to forgive them, then I don't want you to forgive me. <laughs> it really stinks when you say it like that. But Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors in, in the same way. Now, here's where it gets crazy. Jump down, if you're reading along, jump down to verse 14. We're going to come back up and cover the other ones in a minute. As he's done with his prayer, it's like Jesus said, oh yeah, by the way, um, we need to go back and talk about the forgiveness thing because some of you might be struggling with that. In verse 14, he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you. Thank goodness. We love that. But verse 14, 15 says, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And I, I know if, if you're Peter, you're probably like, God, it sounds like you're saying that if I don't forgive other people, even the Gentiles and the Pharisees and the Romans, the tax collectors, God, if I don't forgive them, then you're not going to forgive me. It sounds like that's what you're saying. That's crazy. I think Jesus would say it's exactly what I'm saying. So to whatever degree I forgive others, I want you to forgive me because I'm not going to ask God to do something that I'm not willing to do. This might be the hardest part of this prayer for some of us, and, and here's why. Because there's no doubt in that situation, you were wronged by that person. They hurt you. They cut you deeply. Matter of fact, it may have been so bad that you still carry the remnants from that with you today. You were treating your husband and wife in a different way because of what had happened in the past that you had nothing to do with, but was heaped upon you. And for some reason, we just can't forgive. Why? Because they don't deserve it. Now, hopefully, if you've been with us for more than a month or so, your mind's kind of starting to tick and you're like, did we just talk about this? For whatever reason, Jesus is radically concerned about your relationship with other people, big time. And I don't think it's because of the other people. I think here's what Jesus knows, that forgiveness for other people does more for you than it does for them. I would bet in most of your situations, the person that offended you, they're not walking around thinking about it every stinking day but we are. We can't let go of it because they don't deserve it. You're right they don't deserve it, but it's killing you. And Jesus knows when you, when you let that go, when you just move on, when you just get over it, it's going to help you. It's going to help your soul. Therefore, forgive me to the same level that I am willing to forgive other people because forgiveness is for your benefit. And if you remember this from last time, if you're not willing to forgive those who wounded you, you're going to bleed on those who never cut you. You're going to be a walking, wounded person because of something, some event or some timeline that happened in your life that you really had no control over. And Jesus said, you know what? You've got to let that go. It's going to kill you. I want you to literally be willing to surrender your hurt. Sorry, I skipped that one. To surrender your hurt. Give it to me. You let me deal with it. Now, <laughs> pause. What that doesn't mean is, God, I'm going to surrender my ex to you and hope that you just may fall into a pit of snakes, dear Jesus, in the name of God. Amen. Um, okay, maybe not like that, but be willing to say, I know, and every time I see them on social media or every time it's brought up or every time my kids come back or everything that happens in my life, it just destroys my soul. It hurts so bad, and I just can't get over it, and all those emotions come back, and Jesus would say, I know. And you're asking me to forgive you when you mess up, but you're not willing to hold on to that, to which our response is, you're right, but they don't deserve it. <laughs> I just can't help but think if you weren't having a real conversation with Jesus, he'd go, and you do? I mean, I, I saved you, and you didn't do anything. I think the trophy of the New Testament is the thief on the cross is going to be walking around in heaven. I guarantee you this. If you're here today, 
You know more about Jesus Christ than that thief on the cross does. And he's going to be strolling around in heaven because for whatever reason, the man in the middle said that he could go because of his faith and he didn't deserve anything. But Jesus forgave him in the same way. I want you to forgive me. We need that, right? Here's why confession is good in case you, um, there's a thought for some of us that, well, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and he forgived him past, present, and future. So I don't need to keep doing that. And in a way, that's true. But confession, I mean, hold on, let me back up. Yes, that's true. Your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. But why is bringing them up important? Because I believe confession maintains that relationship with your heavenly father. It's a constant realization that, up, oh, I knew that was wrong. I knew I shouldn't have done that. And I turned from it. And so Jesus is doing that to us and asking us, are you willing to do that to others? So before you move on with your prayer, look around and see, is there anyone else in your life you need to forgive? And until you're ready to surrender your hurt, you can't go on. So you have a, just a brilliant stair step. There are some people that um, actually think that the Bible was made up by religious people after the whatever, which love to debate that with you all day long. Um, there's no possible way that the first century people could have this sort of brilliance. This is nothing other than God-inspired scripture that says, until you're willing to surrender your will, I want you to surrender your independence. I want you to surrender your hurt. I want you to move yourself into a position that you are worthless. You have no value at all if it weren't for Jesus Christ. And then when you do that, I will show you a valuable that's incomparable to anything you've ever seen. But you got to move yourself into that place. And until you're ready to do that, don't, don't go on with your prayer. Do you realize at this point we haven't really even asked God for anything? Haven't asked us to heal us? You know what's really weird? In all the letters that Paul wrote to churches, and we have copies of those, the Corinthians and Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, all of those letters, Romans, not once does he ever pray for someone's health. Never prays that they are that they feel better. I, I pray for that all the time. Paul never did, but here's what he did pray. Use this illness, use this tragedy, tragedy to shape who they are in Christ. And so I believe Jesus is saying, get to the point of surrender. Surrender your will, surrender your independence, surrender your hurt. Here's the last one. Surrender my desires. This is a fun one too. Kind of easier, but I don't think we're being honest with ourselves, right? Surrendering your desires. Here's what Jesus says in his prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus himself knows all about temptation. This is a man who's preaching to us about temptation and he knows it all too well. Um, if you want to turn there, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 talks about this. When the writer of Hebrews says, For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he is without sin. So there's a qualification there that Jesus has faced every temptation that you and I have, and yet he beat it. So in his prayer, he says, um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And because Jesus knows what temptation is, and because he's been through it, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the next verse says, so because we know that, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in our time of need. So because Jesus knows what we're talking about, we approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? Because we've asked Jesus to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, here's, here's where we'll have another little talk. I love, I love our family talks. These are so helpful. Um, I'm just kidding. The, uh, do you think sometimes when we pray this, we don't mean it? 
I kind of wonder if sometimes we don't pray, lead us not into temptation. We take this and we change it. We baptize this a little bit and make it sound churchy and say, God, um, I'm getting ready to sin. Okay, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going out with her. I'm doing this with this guy. I'm, I'm, I'm spending the money this way. I'm going to say this to my coworker. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to sin, but I want you to forgive me afterwards. Is that not the slippery slope of forgiveness? If you really know your sins are forgiven past, present, and future, then why don't we just continue sinning because God will forgive us? And that's actually in Scripture. And Paul said, you know, are you going to continue in sin just so that your grace will be overloaded on you? And then Paul says, God forbid. No, be like Jesus. Because temptation is interesting. If you have kids here today, you're going to have to explain this to them on the way home. Um, or take them to Camp Rock real quick because they're doing some crazy things back there. But moms and dads, adults, let's talk. Temptation's fun, right? Don't, don't, don't you look at me, those church, some of you are like, what? Yes, that's why it's called temptation because we want to do it. I made the mistake one time at Clydehurst at saying that sin is fun. I just kind of got wrapped up in my thing to a bunch of fourth graders. I had to unpack that one for a week. But, um, but it is. There is an immediate, I know this isn't a word, but I have to use it, funness that happens with sin. Now, yes, it fades away. And yes, it will destroy. But in the moment, it's the funnest thing you think you'll ever do. And so Jesus says, before we even get there, yes, I'm going to forgive you. Yes, I'm going to remove that sin as far as the east is from the west. Yes, you're still going to spend eternity with me if you do this sin. But before we ever get there, here's how I want you to pray. Lead me not into temptation. Don't even make that temptation there because I know I'm going to fail when it happens. I'm not that I'm going to plan on evil and hope that you forgive me. That's called being a hypocrite. Jesus says, no, let's, let's get it on the front end. You pray, lead us not into temptation. To which I may add on because I can find it all by myself, right? So before it ever happens, God, don't tempt me. Here's what that sounds like in our world. I'm acknowledging that today I cannot face these temptations without you. And if you don't show up, I'm going to jack up my marriage. I'm going to jack up my future. I'm going to jack up my job. I'm going to lose everything because I can't handle the temptations. I need you to make sure that I don't even get led into that place. Deliver me from the evil one. This was a couple of years ago, but we said there's always two or three things at stake when you face temptation, right? Because whether or not you sin or don't sin is not just about you. Some of you are scarred because dad cheated, because mom couldn't stop drinking, because the drugs were just too much. And you're, you're scarred by that. Here's what I can promise you. They never walked into that situation planning on ruining future generations of the family name. Why? Because they can handle it. I can handle it. I can deal with it. And you are a walking testimony that no, they couldn't handle it. Three things that are at stake every time you face temptation, my family, my future, and my faith. Whether or not I can succeed and handle this temptation is going to affect my family it's going to affect my future, and ultimately, it's going to affect my faith in God. So therefore, God, I beg of you, deliver me from the evil one. You let me face that temptation because I'm going to blow it. And like the others, until you're ready to surrender your desires. Did I show you that one? I may have even just skipped by that one. Until you're ready to surrender your desires, you can't move on. Surrender your will, surrender your independence, surrender your hurts, surrender your desires. And that's it. Prayer's over. That, that, that's how he concludes his prayer. Now, um, 
Some of you right now are thinking, wait, that's not over. There's some more other parts. Okay, let's talk about that. Um, let's have some big boy and big girl exegesis, right? Adult Bible study um, for us here. This will be interesting. Because some of you are thinking, aren't there some other words? Aha, maybe there are. Because here's the way in the, the scripture that you have, you may have learned it. If you notice down at the bottom, it says KJV, which stands for King James Version. And here's the way that verse 13 ends. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But then there's this other part. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right? I mean, that, that, that's the part that we all know. And when you sing it, you know, when you hold that one note out for a really long time, it sounds all majestic. Um, okay, so why in some of your translations, including the translation that's under the seat in front of you, why is that not there? Interesting, interesting Bible study. So let's, let's leave the King James Version for a minute and go to the RSV, which stands for Revised Standard Version. We had to use this in seminary. We called it um, RSV. We called it the Reverse Satanic Version um, because it's a, it's a true, best we can get, word-for-word word translation, which means in the English language, some of this stuff ain't going to make any sense but we had to read it. Here's there, here's in this one, here's the entire prayer in the RSV, and it ends, and forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, done, finished. No more thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. So when you're reading your Bible, you're going to notice this from time to time. Um, this is the one major time when it does it. There's a few other small examples that should make you go, why is that not in there? Well, here's why. Um, here's why we think it's not in there. When the King James Bible was written, um, which is one of our earliest uh, translations that we have, they used the best manuscripts that they had available. So it's, an, it's a phenomenal translation. But then several, two or three hundred years later, there were other manuscripts that we found. And those manuscripts... They didn't change the words, but there was a notice that some of the things in this manuscripts weren't in the original text, that there seemed to be things added. Now, these may blow your mind, and I'm sorry for this, but do you know we don't have the original letters that Paul wrote, um, the book of Romans, that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, we don't have the original letters. They're gone. Most likely destroyed in the fire of 70 AD in Jerusalem. All we have are copies of copies of copies, which means somewhere along the way we got someone's copy of that and they had made notes all throughout it and somehow down the way that got translated. Is this one of those times? We don't know. Why I wanted to include this is to say um, the King James and I believe the NASB are the only two translations out of several hundred that include this last part um, for thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I guess whoever it was thought they needed an ending to that prayer before Jesus goes and talks more about forgiving other people. Now, is it right? Is it wrong? It's neither. I don't believe there's anything wrong with it. So your next question is, well, how do you know what's right? How do you know what was really said? We're going to talk about that next week when we talk about how to read how, how to know when you study the Bible, what the context is, what it means. You ever heard some crazy things on social media? And you're like, does the Bible really say that? We're going to learn how to read in context. We're going to compare some translations. We're going to try to do that all in one Sunday. But learning how to read the Word of God. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's good. I'm not saying it's evil. It's just, it's what is. And the reason I'm mentioning it to you is because if you read a different translation, you may read this and go, wait, where's the ending? I thought the ending was there. A lot of translations leave it out because it wasn't in what they consider to be the best copies of the manuscripts we have. Um, you don't no need to email me on that because it's just, it is what it is. Don't know the real answer, but I just wanted to say that so it didn't trip you up. Now, last thing I do want to say, which I think is important for us, um, you, we learn to surrender our will, our independence, our hurts, and our desires. Let's be honest. Is that the blueprint of your normal prayer life? Don't answer out loud because my guess would be no. It's not of mine. But Jesus said, I want you. 
I want you to surrender. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we wonder why our prayers aren't answered. Could it be that we are not praying in the power of the spirit that God leads us to to begin with because we're willing to bring our own junk in it? I was asked this question actually by two different people, which I thought was kind of strange. What does it mean to, uh, um, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in prayer or pray in the Spirit? What does that mean? Two different people asked me this. I think it's interesting. They may have been from the same Bible studies. That's kind of conniving, if you were, but nonetheless. We pray for you know, money, health, happiness, jobs, that kind of stuff. And God, I will give you surrender of everything except my kids, my money, and my time. I'm going to keep those to myself. To which when we pray like that, that that God that we would pray that to is super tiny. Because your heavenly father would say, I want all of it. You know what's crazy? If he, we don't want to surrender our kids, our money, and our time, because then we fear if we do that, God will take them. Friend, let me let you in on a little newsflash. He does not need your permission to take either one of those things. He can literally do it because he is your creator. The mere fact that he hasn't is just shows his grace and his mercy and his love towards you. So Jesus would say, I want it all. I don't want your kids, your money, and your time. I want you. But I know if I get your kids, your money, and your time, I get you. And so if that's what it takes, that's what I'll do. Because prayer is an act of surrender. And that's why I believe we don't see the Holy Spirit, God-fearing power move in prayer lives all over our churches today because we're not praying in the Spirit. We're not a lot. Do you know the Bible in the same way says that, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available in you? And I believe we can unleash that power. Um, Spirit, lead me where my, my trust is without borders, where I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But before it does that, I've got to surrender. I'm not ready to do that. You move yourself into a position of being literally willing to surrender everything, you will see the Holy Spirit of God move. You'll pray for things and people will look at you like you are dumb. And God will answer those prayers. Why don't we pray those things? I believe it's because we're not willing to surrender the things that we hold so dear and true. So I want you to do this. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want you to ask yourself this question. If, if God truly wants all of you, what are you willing to surrender? And since we've already asked some difficult questions, we'll just keep starting, just keep going. Um, don't sit there in those chairs, and I'm preaching to myself also, and say, God, I'm willing to surrender everything, because no, we're not. There are some things I am scared to death to let go of. And Jesus would say, your entire prayer life is built around surrendering those things to me because you trust that I will provide. And when you do, you will see the Spirit of God move in your life. Do you ever wonder why when the disciples prayed, when reformers and people throughout generations prayed that the ground shook, that just amazing things happened? I believe it's because they were so surrendered and they were willing to not let anything stand in their way of the Spirit of God moving through their life. But I handcuff the Spirit all the time. God, I want you to move and blow through my life with Spirit-changing power, and I want you to change my finances, but I'm not willing to do anything to get me to that point. I just want you to show up and do a miracle. If you're God, you're not going to do that. That's not trust. That's not surrender. But God would say, I, I want it all. And when you do, you won't be left with nothing. You will be left with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I want that for us so bad. I want my prayer life to be like that. I want your prayer life to be like that. So my prayer this morning is would you begin to go down your list of things that maybe you're not willing to let go of? And one by one, 
Let's work on those together. God, I'll surrender my will and allow heaven to come down in my life. For some of you, this may be the hardest. I'll surrender my independence. I'll allow myself to walk in a way that knowing that if if I didn't have what you provided, I would be dead. Some of you need to surrender some hurts. Friend, you've been carrying that pain for so long. And yes, they don't deserve it. Yes, it wasn't right. Yes, it crushed you. But let's stop letting it crush you. Give that to Jesus. There's others of us that need to surrender what we're not willing to let go of and surrender our desires. God, lead me not into temptation because I'm going to blow it. I don't want to trample on the cross and just continue to heap forgiveness upon me because I can't handle myself. God, I know I can't. So lead me not into temptation. I don't want to destroy my family, my future, or my faith. While I pray out loud, you know the place today where God needs to do business. Let's start there. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is absolutely beautiful complete and whole without error. And God, if anything I said today was a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation, I pray that the Spirit works in amazing power and corrects and changes and allows us to see what a powerful prayer life would be. God, we surrender all that we can. And those things that I'm not willing to surrender, God, let's work on those. Let's take the baby steps to get to a point in my life where I'm willing to surrender everything. God, I want to see the Holy Spirit life-changing power through prayer that is seen throughout generations. God, if we're honest, we don't see it much anymore. Maybe we see it in foreign countries and third world countries. God, maybe it's because we have too much. Maybe if it's like Job, we're just, just got it all. So why do we need it? God, if that's where we are and our hearts and our minds begin to take it away, allow us to be totally and fully surrendered to you so that the grace of God, the kingdom of heaven can fill our lives and that we can see a movement of the mighty hand of God. For it's in Jesus' heavenly and precious name we pray. Amen.